Thank you very much. Good evening. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you tonight, um, and also in Kansas City on such a beautiful day as today. Um, I want to start by thanking Lisa, the Linda Hall Library, and a big thanks to Eric and, uh, and Ben. I had a great day touring the exhibit um, and the rare book collection downstairs, and it's, it's really been a thrill to be here. I was telling them at lunch, I think in a different life, I would have been a historian of science and spent my, my career downstairs sifting through all the books they have. So um, I have been working towards my small, very small Frankenstein collection of my own. Um, I actually didn't read Frankenstein, the book, until a few years ago while I was digging deep into science fiction, trying to put uh, my research on CRISPR into the broader context of how scientists have been using new information, new knowledge about how life operates to think about re-engineering life. I wanted to share a few of my favorite quotes from the book. Um, so I definitely identify with Frankenstein just in terms of staying in the lab all night. Uh, I had one of those nights, Monday this week, I was finishing a review article and I was there until five in the morning, so I can definitely identify with seeing the stars disappear into the morning. And then I think also, as a scientist, I mean, what really motivates me going to the lab every day is understanding the physical secrets of the world. And I think that's something that should be celebrated um, in the science world. But of course, we're going to talk about some of the perils of, of how new information can be used both for good, but potentially also for bad. And then also, I think being here at the exhibit and celebrating the 200-year anniversary of Frankenstein, I really love this quote from the preface of the 1831 edition of, of Mary Shelley's book, where she bid her hideous progeny to go forth and prosper. And I think it's remarkable to see where that first singular book has come in 200 years, but also to think about where is Frankenstein going to go in the next 200 years. So there's a fantastic uh, issue of Science Magazine in January that really grappled with this question of where, where are some of these new technologies taking us into the future. We can think about nuclear warfare, about bio-warfare, all of these different uh, uses of the word Frankenstein for, for genetically engineered cells, genes, animals, plants. And I think, when I think about where um, Victor Frankenstein took his idea of creation, starting from kind of the macroscopic, either organs or now in modern day, um, lab-grown organs, or organs from living or deceased uh, humans as a transplant source, what I'm going to talk about today is thinking about creation kind of at a different level, from the bottom up in the microscopic world, about understanding the, the, the stuff of life, DNA, and thinking about using that information and manipulating that information to build cells or potentially entire organisms from the ground up. Now, uh, Lisa already introduced the term CRISPR. In the same issue of Science, they invited readers to submit ideas for kind of what would be the next generation of Frankenstein films. And what was incredible to me, having started working on CRISPR when no one really knew what it was, is that CRISPR and gene editing features prominently in some of the latest ideas of where science and new technologies will take us into the future, either to use it to produce new classes of civilians, or for editing babies, or for editing pigs for xenotransplantation. Of course, these are still in the realm of science fiction, but I think, as you'll find out, we're getting into a point where, where technologies are really advancing to make some of these ideas at least technically possible, begging the question, what are we really going to do with some of these new powers? So I, I couldn't help but play a couple movie clips throughout my talk. So the first one comes from the most recent season of The X-Files. We have to figure this out. What's wrong with the science? Okay. The Spartan virus removes the adenosine deaminase gene from your DNA. Remove the ADA gene and your immune system will simply vanish. Yeah, but I'm not getting sick. It's only a matter of time. Without alien DNA, you don't stand a chance against the Spartan virus. Okay, so how does it work? How does the virus remove the ADA gene? A process called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR -Cas9. RNA and a protein cutting genes at exact locations. Exactly. That was pretty much the pinnacle of my PhD, is seeing CRISPR on the X-Files, on TV. <laughs> 
so all jokes aside, though, obviously alien DNA, not a real thing, but CRISPR as a revolutionary new technology, absolutely a real thing. It's been on the covers of Science Nature multiple times, but also you can go to more mainstream media sources like The Economist, Time Magazine, and, and see really these, these sources celebrating or recognizing this new power to, to, to really manipulate genes and genetic material. And this is the most recent set of headlines from last uh, fall that came out with the publication of a new study where a pathogenic mutation was effectively and efficiently removed in human embryos. And we're going to come back to that topic at the end of my talk. Here's a word cloud of CRISPR. There's a bunch of terminology that I'm not going to talk about today, but I do have the goal of telling you where CRISPR really comes from and, and what is CRISPR? What does it stand for? How is it being used? What does and doesn't it enable? And what are some of the risks that we should be thinking about? And if there's one thing I want you to take away, um, a common misconception is kind of conflating two different types of CRISPR. So CRISPR comes from nature. It's been found and discovered in bacteria. So there's the biology side of CRISPR, which is actually where I started my PhD. And then there's the technology side. And I'm going to tell you about really the beginnings or the origins of CRISPR and how we got from 1987 to 2012 when we basically shifted from CRISPR as a research topic, a basic research topic, to CRISPR as this new technology. So let's go back to 1987. This was a, uh, an article published in a pretty um, obscure journal by a bunch of Japanese scientists. They were studying E. coli, a common gut bacterium and one of the most popular bacteria that researchers use in the lab for basic molecular cloning. And they were interested in a gene called alkaline phosphatase isozyme, not that interesting, but they noticed an unusual structure in the end of this gene sequence where they saw these sequences arranged as direct repeats. And this was pretty unusual, so they ended their paper by commenting that, well, they didn't really know what it's doing and the biological significance of these sequences isn't known. That was 1987, and it would actually take another 20 years for that mystery to be solved. Now let's take a closer look at this unusual structure. So here we have our model of E. coli. I'm looking, I'm showing you here actually an excerpt from its genetic material. These are the A's, T's, G's, and C's that you're all familiar with. And here's the CRISPR highlighted in yellow. The same sequence of letters repeating over and over again. This bacterium somehow stuttered when it was copying its genetic material and, and made this series of, of repeats in a way that really hadn't ever been seen before in genetic material. By the early 2000s, that same type of pattern had popped up in dozens of different bacterial species. And so a bunch of Dutch researchers gave them a name, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, hence the CRISPR. So they knew this is pervasive in nature. Many bacteria have these kinds of stuttering repeats but the function was still a big mystery. The hypothesis being though, if they're so common, they must have some evolutionary benefit. So what's that benefit? What's that purpose? Well, the next big clue came from the very shocking observation in 2005, that if you ignore all the repeats and instead of focus on the snippets of DNA in between those repeats, in fact, many of them are a perfect match to viral DNA. So somehow this bacteria is storing DNA sequences from virus in its own genome. Why would it be doing that? Let me take a brief um, excursion into the world of bacterial viruses. So some of you may not know that in fact, bacterial viruses are the most, most prevalent biological entity on our planet. They number at 10 million trillion trillion. If you take a scoop of, uh, of seawater, you're gonna have about a billion viruses in just one drop. And they look something like this. I kind of think of these as Frankenstein-like creatures. They're kind of lunar spacecrafts. If we look at a, a cross-section, they've got these heads, inside of which is the genetic material of the virus, and then these legs on the tail end that actually latch onto the cell where the DNA can then be injected inside of the bacterial cell. Now, the result of this kind of an infection is that the virus destroys the bacterium literally bursting open the cell with the growing pressure of all of these viruses multiplying inside of the host. And so the hypothesis was maybe bacteria are storing segments of viral DNA 
as a way of protecting against this kind of infection as a type of immune system. So the proof came of all places from a yogurt company. This company was studying a bacterium called Streptococcus thermophilus. It's a $40 billion industry. It's the, it's the major workhorse to make yogurt and a number of different dairy products like mozzarella cheese. And they were interested in engineering more virus-resistant strains of Strep thermophilus. And what they found is that if they infected strains with these sequences, with viruses matching those sequences, those strains were completely immune proving that indeed these CRISPRs, these repeat sequences, were acting as this immune system. And so I really love this analogy that a colleague of mine, Blake Wiedenheft, has come up with, that CRISPRs function kind of like a molecular vaccination card. The bacteria steal these sequences to store a permanent memory of infection in their own genetic material, and then they use that information to recognize the viruses during a future infection. So the next question, and the question that I really grappled with during my PhD was, how does this work? What are the molecular components of this immune system? Uh, but first, let me tell you an analogy. So this is basically what bacteria are doing. They're using CRISPR as a way to recognize the DNA of matching viruses. And I think you can, you can consider this as somewhat analogous to the way that in the US, the Department of Homeland Security might use biometric information like fingerprints or retinal scans as a way to identify and prevent suspected terrorists of entering the country and keeping them outside of the country. And so how does this actually work? Well, it turns out that CRISPR harnesses what we can think about as an incredibly elaborate pair of molecular scissors to recognize and then slice apart the viral DNA. And once that DNA has been severed, it gets further degraded or destroyed, protecting the cell from the infection. And the star player here is this machine called CRISPR-Cas9. We're almost done with the science part, by the way. <laughs> I'm boiling years of research into this one little structure, but uh, basically this is an incredibly powerful protein. It uses a molecule of RNA to do this DNA recognition. And once it recognizes the DNA, it can literally slice the DNA into two pieces. And so you can think of this as having a highly precise pair of GPS coordinates to recognize those matching sequences, and then the payload, which is this ability to cut the DNA in half. So let's look at this in the context of an animation for what's happening during infection. So you've got the virus attacking the cell. It latches onto the outer surface of the bacterium and injects its DNA. The bacterium has about 15 minutes to either neutralize that infection or else it's going to be toast. And so to do that, it assembles this CRISPR-Cas9 machine made up of these molecules of RNA and this protein that I told you is called Cas9. This thing is going to go around the cell looking for any matching sequences, and it can recognize those sequences using base pairing, the same kinds of interactions that hold the double helix together. And once that match is found, that payload activates, and the DNA gets cut into two pieces, and the virus can be destroyed. So the big question then was, once we understand how this process works, what can we, act, what can we do with this? What, how can we harness this, this molecular machinery in different ways? And this fed into the idea of actually repurposing this entire immune system from bacteria for a technology to edit genetic material in other cell types, be it humans, other uh, organisms, other plants, or animals. And so instead of bacteria programming CRISPR to cut and destroy viral DNA, we, the researcher, the scientist, are going to program CRISPR to cut human DNA to enable something called DNA or gene editing. So that was the concept. Well, how would it work? I've shown you this um, illustration already. This is how bacteria cut and destroy viral DNA with CRISPR. We're going to do something very similar in human cells. We've still got our molecular scissors. We're still, going to, we're still going to cut the DNA. But now we're going to harness this new pathway, a DNA repair pathway, to repair that broken site with new genetic material, where we could actually swap out a mutation that the scissors cut at with a new healthy sequence, and therefore repair or edit that original site. So my favorite metaphor for gene editing is like find and replace that you might use in Microsoft Word or Google Docs. You might know some misspelling. You can 
enter it as a search term, and then you want to replace it with some new term. And you can search through a document of some thousand or tens of thousands of characters, find any misspellings, and correct them. But we're going to ask CRISPR to do something much more uh, incredible, which is do this on a document made up of billions of letters. And they're not going to just be the 26 letters of the alphabet, they're going to be just those four A's, T's, G's, and C's. And we want it to be able to recognize just single misspellings that might cause some disease. So in 2012, the seminal paper was published that showed how this could work. And it only took six months for three different laboratories to actually show that indeed you could take CRISPR and put it into human cells or mouse cells and actually accomplish this kind of genome or gene editing. And since 2013, there's just been an explosion of research applying the same core machinery, the same core technology in pretty much every model organism you can think of. Everything from rice and mice and pigs to monkeys, tomatoes, peas, I mean, name an, name an organism and it's probably been edited with CRISPR at this point. And these are actual images of gene edited organisms that have been published in the literature where at the embryo level, CRISPR was micro injected as a way to introduce specific mutations such as a mutation that causes albinism in mice, turning what would previously have been a black mouse into a white mouse by inactivating a gene that's involved in pigmentation. That's the power of using CRISPR for gene editing. So this is just a little bar graph showing how much this technology has exploded. That's primarily due to the fact that in addition to being inexpensive, CRISPR is incredibly easy to use. So there were previous technologies to edit genetic material, but they were very complex. Most labs couldn't access them. But with CRISPR, anyone with a basic background in molecular biology, which is kind of a common skill in the research community, is able to use CRISPR in their uh, research topic of interest. And then because of that ease of use, CRISPR is really impacting so many different areas of research and, and, and research and development whether it be basic research through disease modeling, through xenotransplantation, all the way down to improving human health. And so I want to take the next few minutes to really give you a brief survey on a couple of these major areas before we come back to the use of gene editing in humans. Although I'll note that really I could give an entire talk on any one of these topics. That's how much there's been done. So let me start with basic research. So, as we all know, DNA is the genetic material that, that makes us human or that makes an animal what that animal is or makes plants plants. And with CRISPR, we now have the most powerful way to manipulate that information and interrogate the effects of specific genes on an organism's function. So that might be applying CRISPR in cancer biology to understand the impact of different mutations on cancer development or finding out the vulnerabilities of cancerous cells to being eliminated and opening up new areas for drug development. And then kind of less in the, in, the, in the human medicine space, labs have taken CRISPR and put it into butterflies to understand the genetic basis of wing coloration, or put it into an animal, the killifish, which is a popular model uh, organism for aging studies to understand the genetic basis of aging or put it into the salamander that can regrow limbs to understand limb regeneration. Pretty much any organism that's been a popular organism for a given area of biology can now be manipulated with CRISPR to really improve our understanding of, of this link between DNA and function, DNA and the resulting properties or characteristics of an animal. What about in agriculture? So all of the big ag companies are going haywire over the use of CRISPR for gene editing different kinds of traits into crops or even animals, uh, where they might be able to access genetic variants associated with disease resistance or increased productivity, enhanced nutrition and other kinds of properties, and even um, improved animal health. So I love showing the example of these two cows because there's a company in Minnesota that's actually identified the genetic basis for horn growth and they've used um, a different gene editing platform, actually something that came just before CRISPR, to um, engineer cows to no longer grow horns. Now that sounds a little bit silly, but it turns out that in the dairy industry, it's common practice to saw off the horns of young calves 
because of the risks that they pose the cows when they're growing um, and in kind of um, close proximity to each other, and they're also dangerous for the handlers. But now with, with gene editing, we have a way to do this in a far more harmless way to the animals. And so this is just one example, but there are many other researchers that are trying to use CRISPR in different ways for similar kinds of benefits. Um, there was a New York Times article, I think sometime last year, that actually uh, covered a dinner hosted by a company developing gene editing in agriculture to put on what they called the first dinner with gene edited foods. And I should, have, I should have mentioned, obviously many of us are familiar with um, genetic modification or GMOs. Um, I'd say gene editing is a, a very different kind of genetic engineering technology and, and there's a big debate right now on how it should be regulated, whether it should be put in the same bucket as GMOs or if it should be a separate thing. Uh, maybe that's something we can come back to later. But gene edited foods are now slowly reaching the, the dinner plate. And uh, the CEO of this company speculated that um, things that this table was eating today, that millions of people are going to eat during the 21st century and that this will not stop. They also had some celebrities in attendance and Neil Patrick Harris commented, I don't even know what gene editing is. I thought we were supposed to wear jeans. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny, but I think you know, it also importantly illustrates that you know, most of us aren't going to know what gene editing is, and I think this is a really critical thing to be thinking about as, as companies are deciding how and if to roll out gene edited products, because obviously GMOs have been a very hot button issue, and it's only going to become more complex with some of these newer uh, breeding technologies. Okay, switching complete gears, now we move on to um, gene editing in pigs, and it turns out there's been a long path towards um, reaching this goal of harnessing pigs as a source of organs. Um, and in fact, gene editing is playing right into this, and many hope that uh, with CRISPR, together with other methods like cloning and transgenesis, that we might be able to work towards the generation of humanized pigs that are going to be able to serve as durable uh, our donors for uh, human organs in the future. Um, I usually play a clip here from Jurassic Park, but I'm probably not going to have the time. But um, I'm sure most of you know the general plot of Jurassic Park. Uh, scientists um, find uh, preserved mosquitoes that have blood from the prehistoric era when dinosaurs existed. That blood was uh, derived from dinosaurs. It has dino DNA, and then scientists use said dino DNA to make dinosaurs. So that's obviously crazy science fiction. But how many of you know that there are actually legitimate scientists today that want to do exactly this with the woolly mammoth? So the problem with DNA in dinosaurs is that DNA degrades um, with a half-life of about 10,000 years. So there's no way you're going to be able to have intact DNA from a 65 million year old mosquito specimen. But woolly mammoths went extinct about 3,500 years ago. And Scientists have actually sequenced the entire genome of woolly mammoths. We know exactly when they branched off from a common ancestor with Asian elephants. And there's a catalog of about a million mutations that separate Asian elephants, which exist today, from woolly mammoths, which existed 3,000 years ago. And there's a lab at Harvard that's using CRISPR to try to engineer mutations into cultured elephant cells to slowly go back in time and resurrect the genetic state of the woolly mammoth. Now, is this going to lead to a live woolly mammoth being born someday? Um, maybe not, maybe. Uh, but the point is that with, with this kind of new power to rewrite DNA, this idea is no longer complete science fiction. I mean, there's a, there's a lab doing it today. And then we got to come back to, of course, the human condition. And I'd say some of that was all bells and whistles to tell you about some of the, the fun things that are being done with CRISPR. But I, you know, the real discovery and I, I think the real holy grail application of this type of technology is really to use it for, for curing genetic diseases, for curing different kinds of human conditions like cancer. And with a power to rewrite DNA, we can start thinking about treating diseases like sickle cell or cystic fibrosis or Huntington's in a completely different way where rather than having to turn to bone marrow transplants or the kinds of um, drugs that you might have to take every day or every week or every month, 
can we actually harness CRISPR to go into the cells of patients and repair that mutation at its source so that the entire foundation of the disease is gone? And I hope that this messy slide can convince you that, at least in the laboratory, this is totally doable. So working with cultured human cells, which can be grown in the laboratory, it's now been years since researchers have corrected the, the mutations that cause sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, fragile X, uh, hemophilia, a form of blindness. You know, this has become standard uh, art in the research lab to use CRISPR in cultured cells to make mutations that can repair uh, disease uh, mutations. The next question is going to be, can we actually translate these technologies into patients, where we have to not only grapple with the molecular machinery, but also with questions of delivery, of how to safely administer CRISPR into the body of patients or into cells in a way that will be durable, that will be safe to put back into patients. And we can kind of put these uh, types of therapies in a few different buckets. Um, ex vivo, where we might treat cells outside of a patient. These might be blood stem cells to correct a mutation before the cells are transplanted back into the patient. Or I'd say the more challenging in vivo therapy, where cells are edited directly inside of the patient, either systemically or in targeted organs. And in fact, there's already been a story that came out last year where gene editing was used to save the life of a patient that was suffering from uh, leukemia, and basically the doctors had given up on her, but ended up um, getting approval to use a new uh, experimental therapy on a compassionate use basis. And they used gene-edited immune cells, which were able to bring her health back up to a point where she could receive a bone marrow transplant and send her leukemia completely into remission. And so I think the, the promise here is that CRISPR is going to really make this type of therapy even more common in the coming decade, where in the U.S. it's already been approved for clinical trials, and in China, a number of clinical trials have actually already begun using CRISPR for this kind of new cancer treatment. And then beyond cancer immunotherapy, which is what I just discussed, there are three major companies in the U.S. that are pursuing a number of different genetic diseases. And I think we're really going to see in the next five years or so some of the important preclinical data to determine whether or not this new way of treating disease, this new form of medicine, is really going to be as good as we all hope. Um, but then let's come back to um, this issue of when we would actually, or when could we use CRISPR in humans. So I just talked about, um, you know, treatments that would treat living patients with disease. But in fact, um, it's been recognized for decades that any new genetic engineering technology could also be applied much earlier in development, and in fact could be applied at the earliest stage of life, the mating of an egg and sperm. And this gets to the topic of what's known in the scientific community as germline gene editing, where the germline refers to cells like eggs, sperm, embryonic stem cells that are involved in reproducing the organism such that any changes you make in the germline would not only affect this resulting individual, but all former offspring of that individual. So you can imagine this is a completely different type of edit because it's permanent. It's going to last through the generations. As opposed to somatic cells like blood cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, where the editing could have a very real impact on that patient's life, but would not cross over to the next generation. And so if we compare these kind of two major categories of gene editing in humans, I just told you that somatic editing, so treating living patients, has a very, challenge, a very large challenge with delivery. Whereas, somewhat remarkably, in the germline, because of in vitro fertilization, it's become quite common and routine to manipulate embryos and manipulate germ cells. And so delivery can be accomplished just with micro-injection. The way that a lot of IVF clinics now use IVF by injecting sperm directly inside of egg cells. Somatic editing would treat affected living individuals. Germline editing would treat future individuals. And those changes would be heritable for germline editing as opposed to being not heritable in somatic editing. 
Somatic editing, as I told you, has already been pursued in clinical trials, whereas in the germline, that's unprecedented. It's never been done. And not surprisingly, this is an extremely controversial topic of, of if we should do this, of whether or not this is something that researchers or physicians should be pursuing. Um, I couldn't resist playing one last movie clip and also give myself a chance to get a drink, so I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Gattaca, but here's another short clip. Like most other parents of their day, they were determined that their next child would be brought into the world in what has become the natural way. Your extracted eggs, uh, Marie, have been fertilized with Antonio's sperm. After screening, we are left, as you see, with two healthy boys and two very healthy girls. Naturally, no critical predispositions to any of the major inheritable diseases. All that remains is to select the most compatible candidate. First, we may as well decide on gender. Have you given it any thought? Uh, we would want Vincent to have a brother, you know, um, to play with. Of course you would. Hello, Vincent. You have specified hazel eyes, dark hair, and uh, fair skin. I have taken the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions, uh, premature baldness, myopia, alcoholism, and addictive susceptibility, uh, propensity for violence, obesity, etc. We didn't want, I mean, diseases, yes, but... Uh... Right, we were just wondering if, if it's good to just leave a few things to, to chance. You want to give your child the best possible start. Believe me, we have enough imperfection built in already. Your child doesn't need any additional burdens. And keep in mind, this child is still you. Simply the best of you. You could conceive naturally a thousand times and never get such a result. A little bit haunting. Um, let me take this moment to, to make it very clear that most of the things that this physician discussed wouldn't be possible even with CRISPR. So we know a lot about the human genome now. We, we know it's linked to many diseases. We know some of the links to certain traits. But for the most part, the things he mentioned, like obesity, predisposition for violence, uh, alcoholism, those are not caused by single genes. There's no gene editing in the world that's going to ever have anything to do with those, because these kinds of traits, some cases are learned. And in some cases, the genetic basis, if there is one, results from thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mutations, um, each one of which has a minuscule impact. So much of this is going to securely stay in the world of science fiction. But, but the idea that we could use gene editing at the embryonic level, that's, that's very real. And it's something that um, Jennifer Doudna, my, my PhD advisor, I think recognized early on, as well as many other of us, and um, hosted one of the first bioethics meetings to begin discussing uh, this new realization that with this technology, what used to be kind of shrugged or pushed aside because it wasn't even technically possible, now might be. And so I think partly as a consequence of that meeting, the, the governments really started paying attention. So the Obama administration put out a statement in 2015 that uh, altering the human germline for clinical purposes is a line that should not be crossed at this time. The National Institutes of Health will not currently fund any use of gene editing technologies in human embryos, and also touted this, this viewpoint that this is a line that should not be crossed. And I'm supposed to, or not supposed to, but I can plug one of the later speakers in the lecture series who's coming from the NIH. And then even the um, intelligence community actually placed genome editing on their weapons of mass destruction list in 2015, true story, because of um, this being a dual-use technology that could be used in ways that would have economic and national security implications. It's important to point out that these actually specifically mentioned clinical uses, clinical purposes. But in fact, in 2015, that was also the year that for the first time ever, CRISPR and gene editing more broadly was actually tested on human zygotes or, or human fertilized embryos. You can actually see an embryo here being micro-injected with this, with this micropipette placing the CRISPR molecules inside of, of the embryo. This, of course, provoked a massive backlash, um, both in the, in the popular media, but also in the scientific community, with these kinds of titles like the crack of doom, um, concerns being raised among scientists. Uh, 
And I think some of these concerns were placated by the fact that these researchers had used so-called tripronuclear or non-viable embryos. These were embryos that were essentially discarded from an IVF clinic because they couldn't even ever develop into a viable uh, human life. But in fact, I think there is this inexorable path towards future tool development or technology development. And it's now, just two years later, that the latest studies come out of a group in Oregon correcting a pathogenic gene mutation in human embryos, viable embryos, and in a couple dozen embryos that were used in this experiment. And importantly, whereas the previous study actually highlighted a lot of the risks and, and um, kind of side effects of this type of treatment in terms of whether or not CRISPR always makes the edit you want versus other kinds of unintended changes, this study really advanced the technology in embryos. They showed that you could develop new ways of injecting CRISPR that were safer. You could avoid something called mosaicism, where the genetic composition of the embryo is actually mixed. And so I think it's, it's clear that technical hurdles are falling left and right. And so it's really becoming not a question of if this will be possible, but, but is it going to be something that we all as a society think should be pursued? And of course, those, those headlines that I showed at the beginning of my talk were the direct result of this study coming out. Now, um, the debate over should we be doing this continues. So uh, the National Academies hosted an international summit in 2015 that put out a statement um, calling this irresponsible to pursue any clinical uses of this germline editing. And then last year, they put out a, a systematic exhaustive report. But interestingly, I think, there were some murmurs that they really left open uses of CRISPR for eliminating disease-associated mutations, noting that these research trials might be permitted for compelling reasons and under strict oversight. And then if you go outside of the National Academies, more broadly, you have scientists saying, well, actually, there's a moral imperative to continue this research. You have people saying, well, this is like playing God, but what's wrong with that? Um, there have been groups founded to directly protest the use of CRISPR-Cas9 for what they call transgenic babies. They're not technically transgenic, but... Um, and then you have very real debates between respected academics on whether or not we should be doing this. Yes, if the evidence shows the technique is safe and effective. No, the risks and ethical questions uh, call for caution. So there's not anywhere near enough time to get into the, the kind of richness of the ethical debate, but I thought I'd just catalog some of the common arguments that have made against. So for some, this is just wrong because it's playing God. It's interfering with a natural process. Um, UNESCO has actually put out this view that, that the human genome is something not to be tampered with. It's the heritage of humanity, and so manipulating it jeopardizes human dignity. There's the issue of the fact that if you're making a change in an embryo, you're, you're, you're changing the genetic state of a future individual without having received their consent. There's a concern that if we start, you know, treating CRISPR as something that can eliminate disabilities or mutations, is that going to change the way that society views those that might already be living with those uh, disabilities? Are we going to be putting too many resources into these technologies in the germline at the expense of focusing on the patients living today with disease. And then finally, if we think about the future implications of using gene editing, could this actually lead or create genetic inequalities, uh, the genetic haves and the have-nots? And of course, this is something that many authors have grappled with before. So two books that I also reread when I was researching the book I wrote with Jennifer, of course, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, both of these explored um, a future of either genetic casts, in the case of Brave New World, or a very far distant future where the human species is actually branched off into two separate species, the Eloi and the Morlocks. And then here's my clever link back to Frankenstein. So as we know, in Mary Shelley's book, The Bride of Frankenstein was never brought to fruition. And in fact, Victor Frankenstein commented, a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth if he made her bride, who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I a right for my own benefit to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? 
So the same fear that, that Frankenstein's monster could actually lead to a new species of man or a perversion of man that might actually put the human species at risk. So to kind of begin tying this to a close, I think it's interesting to consider what, what, what are the lessons from Frankenstein, the book? Who's the real monster in Frankenstein? And of course, uh, Frankenstein's monster, his creation, says in the book, I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. He started out with good in his heart. It was only being rejected by Frankenstein, being rejected by people that were afraid of him that led him to turn into a villain. And so I think the book isn't just a cautionary tale about scientific hubris, but it's really about scientists failing to assume moral responsibility for their creations. And I really love this quote from this recent issue of Science I mentioned earlier, commenting on the fact that, you know, in the public, many people forget that Frankenstein is the name of the scientist, the creator, not the monster that he created. But touching upon that, he wrote, those who think that Frankenstein is the name of the monster are in fact, in reality, more correct than not. And so I think as this relates to CRISPR, the moral imperative is, is not to try to shove this technology under the rug or banish it or get rid of it, but really to rise up to the challenge to, to use this technology responsibly. So when it comes to germline editing, to really carefully and deeply consider all of the safety, ethical, and regulatory concerns, to make sure that the discussion about what and if to do in this sphere isn't just being decided by scientists or by politicians or regulators, but by people from all walks of life and from the, from the public at large, because this is really an issue that doesn't just touch the biomedical community, it's gonna affect our society as a whole. In plants and animals, I think we can pursue responsible applications of gene editing in a transparent way. And then I think really, as much as I hope I haven't scared you about some of these perils of CRISPR, the real focus by most people working with this technology, myself included, is to use this technology to develop safe and effective therapeutics, things that can save lives or improve lives in a way that's gonna be accessible to patients and really uh, benefit our society. My last little lesson is uh, a plug for how important I think basic scientific research is. Um, I really wanted to play a clip from Young Frankenstein, but I resisted, but here's my, at least my picture of it. So it wasn't this guy or this guy that kind of in a harebrained scheme came up with the idea for CRISPR, uh, the idea of how we could rewrite DNA. It was actually a collection of researchers that were grappling with a much more interesting and basic question, which was how bacteria defend themselves against viruses. And I think the lesson in, in, in the CRISPR discovery and the, the origin story of CRISPR is that we really need to continue following our curiosity wherever it leads us because you really never know where that next big discovery is going to come from. And so with that, um, I want to thank you all for listening and I want to end by acknowledging Jennifer, who was my co-author for the book. I spent um, the last eight or nine years in sunny Berkeley, California. It's been a little bit less sunny, a little bit less warm in New York, but it's been exciting to start my lab at Columbia. Um, but thanks for the invitation to Kansas City, and I'll be happy to take some questions. If you have questions, I'll come by with a microphone. We're videotaping and we're broadcasting a live stream worldwide, so we want to get the audio of your question. Are there, are there a million uh, listeners already, Ben? Or there, what have you got? A million? A million and a half? 2.3 okay. million viewers okay. right now. Um, so raise your hand, I'll come by. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Um, I'm very interested in this topic because I have one of these rare diseases. And so my kids, they both inherited it from me. There's a 50% chance that if you have it, your kid is going to get it too. So I knew about the stuff about the embryos, but I wasn't aware that they're working on or sometimes they can do stuff to where they can do people or children. My question is, what I have is a bone disease to where I have tons and tons of uh, different bone growths. 
if you, um, you know, did the CRISP thing to where the person no longer had the disease, uh, and I don't know if this question is too hard, but I'm just kind of curious, what would happen to what has already happened? Because, um, you know, these growths grow with the rest of your body. So as an adult, nothing is happening with the disease. But if you in, injected it to where I didn't have the disease anymore, what would happen to, I don't know, maybe I have a hundred bone growths in my body, what mm -hmm. would happen to them? What would happen to what has already, um, the condition? How would that change the condition or would that not change the condition? Unfortunately, well outside of my expertise, but I will say, I mean, I think the real challenge with a lot of um, diseases is, again, this delivery issue. So most diseases that are being pursued are either in the blood or in very specific organs like the lungs or the liver, where delivery has already to some extent been um, tackled and solved. Whereas something very systemic like bones, I think there's the question of, of would you be able to access and edit enough cells um, that, that you'd be able to tackle this kind of a condition? And that's something that I really can't answer, but, but that, would be the, that would be the thing to look into, the, the, the delivery issue. Dr. Sternberg, uh, back here in the, about the middle of the room. Hello, thank Hi. you for coming. Uh, I'm interested in uh, cancer, uh, use of CRISPR with cancer, different types of cancer, and from uh, brain to liver to breast, ovarian, that kind of thing. Uh, has anything been developed for any of those? So I know in some of the clinical trials that have started in China are going after lung cancer and other um, solid cancers, but for the most part, much of the work is going after blood-based cancers, again, because delivery um, is much easier. It's much easier to access blood stem cells than it would be to go after solid tumors, and especially tumors that are gonna reside in different organs and be much more difficult to access. Sam, up here on your right, let me come here behind you. Okay, I actually have two questions. First, does the library have your book? Yes. Oh, they do? Okay, good. Yes, we have two copies. Okay, good. And my second question is, um, how do you see the CRISPR um, connected to eugenics, which has been around for a long time, but was done with different types of technology? But now that we've got this, how does that fit? Yeah, so we, we discussed that in the book. Um, I mean, I think that ties back into this question of, or the concern that by having a technology to erase disease-associated muta disease mutations, is it gonna change the way we think about disease or bring back this idea that we can breed ourselves or scrub out disease-associated mutations in a selective way? Um, I think that's a real risk. That's something at that 2015 International Summit was discussed by multiple speakers. There were many questions about it. You know, I think part of eugenics also originated because that was largely like a state-run system. And I mean, there were states and governments that instituted laws about sterilization or whatnot um, that I think, I believe we progressed to a point where the government is not gonna come in and be able to mandate certain things with CRISPR. But it's, it's absolutely a consideration that needs to be made. And I think we need to learn from where this country came. I mean, there's, you know, it's, e People often associate eugenics with the Nazis and with you know, World War II, but in fact, much of that was inspired by what happened in America and the UK. And we need to really learn from what, how things have evolved here and make sure that we don't go in the same place again. Sam, we have a question on your left over here. Do you see any parallels with the work done on uh, biobots or organobots in terms of gene editing? I recently had a conversation with a person at MIT and they saw that the ethical questions remain the same for both. I'm going to plead ignorance on biobots. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't actually, what do you mean, do you, can you elaborate on what you mean by biobots? They're robots, but they're, they're or, or either they're hybrid biobots or organobots where they're actually doing gene editing to, in terms of the healthcare delivery to instill these things in the body to try to correct problems. Yeah, I mean, I know people are also using CRISPR for, there's kind of an idea that you could engineer bacteria to serve as kind of 
um, reporters for different disease states by passing through your gut and monitoring levels of inflammation and whatnot. I don't know if that's encompassed within biobots. Um, I think many technologies have similar questions over how they should be developed, uh, but more than that, I can't really say about biobots. Sorry. Dan, we're going to stay up here on your left. Um, I have a question about time scales and about the fact that a lot of the technologies that are dealing with bacteria and viruses are on very fast scales mm -hmm. of uh, reproduction and change. And human systems and many of our other ecological systems seem to have adapted to a much slower pace of change. And I wonder if you see that we might be creating some really big problems by bringing these timescales together in that way. Yeah, so maybe one thing I'll mention that I took out of my talk just for time considerations. There's one other major technology that CRISPR has been used for called gene drives, which are um, a way of spreading uh, genes into wild populations at a very rapid pace. And so that's being developed um, so far just in the laboratory, but there's a, a very large number of researchers that want to use gene drives to create modified mosquito populations that are resistant to the malaria parasite, but release these into the wild so that you would effectively be spreading traits into wild populations that were first engineered in the laboratory to rid regions of malaria. Now, malaria kills like almost a million people every year, so that might seem to many people like an you know, unequivocally good thing, but there's also the risk that if we start putting things out that can spread rapidly and with extremely high efficiency, I mean, they're basically super Mendelian and that they, they essentially break the laws of Mendel and inheritance because they don't spread that way, then these things will get out of control. And once they're out in the wild, it's not going to be possible to recall them the same way that on a human time scale, you can engineer, let's say, an embryo, let's say that leads to a pregnancy. That individual is going to take 20 years or 15 years to reach puberty until they can have their own children. So these things are going to have a very fixed rate at which they could propagate, whereas mosquitoes have a very fast reproductive time, and that question is very different for, for those quicker time scales. So I think that's something that for gene drive technology in particular is a big concern. And again, that could be a whole other talk because there are a lot of researchers working on this. There's a lot of discussion at the regulatory level about how gene drive research should be um, policed and at what point should that be allowed to go to field trials given that the risks of escape are much, much larger than with all the different applications I talked about. Sam, back here towards the uh, back of the room. Hi. Um, University of Kansas is doing research on Alzheimer's disease and they found that there's uh, chemicals in some people's brains that um, cause this. Is there any chance that CRISPR could work on that? I'll just say blanket, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I should preface, by the way, I mean, as Lisa said, I'm in the biochem department, so I have no uh, medical credentials whatsoever. Um, I think with Alzheimer's and a lot of these kinds of diseases, I think the initial promise is not in therapeutics, it's really in harnessing CRISPR to understand disease physiology much better. Because if there's a hypothesis about the involvement of a certain gene or maybe a certain small molecule drug might target some protein that's involved in dealing with this protein aggregation issue, now with CRISPR you can go in, you can make mutations in cultured cells, in neurons, in, in iPSCs, which are induced pluripotent stem cells, and actually tackle those hypotheses in a much more powerful way than if you're just taking cells from a patient um, or from a deceased patient or from a, you know, embryonic stem cell line. You can actually go and make changes and test those hypotheses. So I think for, for again, the basic research side of disease, I'm sure CRISPR would be impacting that. And I mean, really, most researchers that study disease now are using CRISPR in some kind of way as a, an additional tool in the toolbox. Um, whether on the therapeutic side there's something there, I, I'd need to learn more about it first. Sam, so way back here uh, towards the back of the room on your left. Hello. Um, so we, myself uh, and some other students here were first introduced to CRISPR in one of our high school, sci in one of our high school science cool. classes. Um, 
we like to talk about, you know, all the biological implications as well as the ethical implications. And one thing I would love to know is, has CRISPR gone where you expected to since it wor you worked with it so closely since its fruition? Um, I would say it's gone roughly where I expected it to, but much faster than I would have thought. So I'll share a quick anecdote um, that we talk about in the book. So in 2014, I was approached by a woman um, through a friend, a cousin of a friend of a friend or something like that. <laughs> and she um, had started a company in San Francisco called Happy Healthy Baby. And she basically was pitching to me as a potential co-founder or like first hire to be a part of this company to offer CRISPR to future parents combined with IVF. She seemed totally wacko to me, to be honest. And this was also in 2014 before anyone had messed with embryos. Um, it was around the time that the first non-human primates, or the first monkeys, had been edited with CRISPR. But, I mean, I honestly felt like this came completely out of left field and she's like 20, 30, 40, 50 years a little bit ahead of her time. But then, you know, later that year, Jennifer organized this bioethics meeting it became clear once that non-human primate study came out that actually you can tap, you could tap directly into well-established procedures for IVF. People were working on different ways of delivering CRISPR into cultured cells in a way that also translated directly to IVF. So I think it totally opened my eyes to the possibility that this is going to move much more quickly than we would have thought in 2014. And going back to 2012, I mean, Yes, there was speculation, but I think, you know, I was talking to someone earlier at the uh, downstairs at the reception, and there was, I mean, when I joined Jennifer's lab to work on CRISPR, the idea of this becoming a technology was not in my own mindset at all. I just thought, again, coming back to this, this picture, this is what fascinated me. So to see it grow that quickly from something that even amongst the scientific community was mostly just a niche, unknown research area to where we are today, I think most of us are, are are kind of uh, amazed at how quickly it's moved. Sam, uh, the question back here on your right. And uh, due to the time, let's do two more questions. We'll do this question. Dr. Sklar, I see your hand up. <laughs> we'll uh, make yours the last question. Uh, hi, on your slide, I saw that you had a bullet for do-it-yourself DIY mm. CRISPR. Um, and I've seen some good, kids good to eyes. make like a glow-in-the-dark yeast, which I think is pretty cool. But could you provide some inspiration or ideas for projects that might be done in the home lab that are safe and ethical? And <laughs> yeah, I love that you picked that up. Um, actually, that was also a recent addition to my slide. That didn't used to be on that slide. But so there's uh, a guy in Oakland. Um, that I've met a couple times now, who is the CEO of a company called The Odin, and he started selling CRISPR DIY kits a number of years ago. Um, they will send you like a pipette, some agar plates, some E. coli, some <laughs> mini chromosomes that express Cas9 and the RNA molecule that's part of CRISPR, and you can genetically engineer your own E. coli at home. And there are videos online to show how this works. Um, I'll plug, by the way, uh, so there's an institute at Berkeley called the Innovative Genomics Institute. They're actually constructing their own kind of DIY CRISPR kit as an educational tool. And I think I've given a couple of talks where educators were in the audience, and I think there's a, I, I think it's great that, that students are, are hopefully learning about CRISPR as a way to access biology and genetics, and um, some of these kits will hopefully make that possible. DIY has been also in the news for uh, more negative reasons lately because some people, I'd say, are taking it too far, and so there is also an active discussion about what should we make available to do at home and what should still stay off limits. But um, I love the angle of educating anyone who wants to learn and play with CRISPR at home should be able to. So the ODIN is what you want to look up, and then also the Innovative Genomics Institute. They're rolling that out, I think, sometime this year. So I want to go back to the beginning of your talk, uh, which kind of intrigued me. I've thought a lot up to, through the whole talk. You know, bacteriophage has been around for a long time. Yes. But <clears throat> uh, 
The way that this whole evolved out of uh, the dedication of CRISPR and the ability of bacteria to resist a viral infection. I love that we're ending on this note, by the way, so thank you in advance. Um, we're dealing in medicine with a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And I'm wondering if you would, one can take these antibiotic resistant bacteria, identify where they would be sensitive to a particular virus, even one that could be engineered that's not got a CRISPR type response and use that to treat patients? That's a fantastic question. Um, so yeah, I mean, phage therapy, as I'm sure you know much better than I do, was a big thing in the 1920s and 30s after phages were first discovered by de Harel and uh, what's the other guy's name? I forget. Um, and then antibiotics came along and then people thought there's no need for phages anymore because antibiotics do it way better. I think there's slowly a resurgence coming with the idea of phage therapy. And specifically with CRISPR, there are two companies that I could tell you more about later that are engineering phages to deliver CRISPR, where in kind of a reversal of the way CRISPR normally operates, the idea is take a phage that has um, tropism for specific bacteria and use the phage as a vector to deliver CRISPR so that after infection, the bacteria will kill itself because bac CRISPR can also cause a bacterium to kill itself if it accidentally targets its own genome. So people are harnessing phages as delivery vectors for selective bacterial killing. We were talking downstairs about the microbiome. Was that with you or with another gentleman? Um, because obviously you don't, I mean, one downside of antibiotics, you typically clear out your entire microbiome and we know that there's a lot of benefits there's the guy. So the idea with using CRISPR and this kind of phage therapy is that you can have very selective killing where you're using the same specificity for particular DNA sequences to only kill those bacteria that are pathogenic. So there's a couple, there are two main companies that are pursuing this and there's been some proof of concept work published on that. Um, but I think more generally phage therapy, I mean, there are, I have a lot of friends that are phage biologists that, you know, go out into various, samp you know, the ocean or sewer water and try to isolate phages that infect their bacteria of interest way better than anything else. And I think there's a real possibility that that type of exploration could open up new types of therapies. Sam, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending tonight's program. Our next event is April 5th. Dr. Benjamin Gross, the library's very own Vice President for Research and Scholarship, will give a talk on his new book, The TVs for Tomorrow. And as Dr. Sternberg mentioned, we have two more lectures in the uh, Frankenstein Lecture Series on CRISPR. April 26th and May 10th, check lindahall.org for details. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Eric.